The theme for this conference, the uh, Native Americans in show business honoring the Carlisle Indian School students. I knew immediately we had to try to get Jesse Wente here from Toronto. Jesse is an Ojibwa film critic and known as the most respected voice in cinema. <laughs> but more, more so even than that, he loves movies. He loves program, programming, critiquing, and as we saw today, sometimes even acting in them. Yes. So please help me welcome Jesse Wente. Thank you. Thank you all uh, for coming. Before I get started, uh, as is tradition for the Ojibwe, I'd first like to acknowledge and thank the Susquehannock, the original keepers of this land, for hosting us all here today, and indeed for hosting this museum and the community of Carlisle on their land uh, throughout history. Um, I wasn't going to start with this photo. This isn't actually the, the, where the presentation begins. It'll begin in a second. But you know, sitting in on the sessions yesterday, um, you know, I wanted to, I guess, show this this photo. I am from Toronto, Canada, uh, home of, you know, ice hockey, three down football, um, universal health care, and gun control, all those wonderful things uh, for you folks. Uh, we're also, however, home to uh, residential schools. And this uh, is a photo taken at the residential school in Spanish, Ontario. Uh, in the back right hand corner, you see the little girl with uh, the, she's got a friend's arm over her shoulder. That's my grandmother, Norma. Uh, she was one of eight children taken from her parents. They were the chief and medicine woman of the uh, tribe at that moment. They took all eight kids, the government, put them in Spanish, which was notorious for torturing its children. And I guess ultimately, you know, Cindy gave a great introduction, very flattering introduction, but I, in retrospect, I think maybe this photo says more about my identity and where I come from than anything you're going to read on the internet. Uh, so there's my grandmother, and um, they did kill the Indian inside her. She never went back to her community. She didn't. She lost her language. Uh, so I don't speak Ojibwe either. Neither does my mother. Um, but I like to think that uh, I'm, she'd be very happy that I'm here today, and I'm certainly speaking uh, using her voice today. So. Problems already. There we go. This is the actual beginning of the, the presentation. So this is an image. Um, well, I'll say a couple of things. Um, so I'm really here to talk about the current state of indigenous cinema. And when I talk about indigenous cinema, I'm not talking about movies made about indigenous people. I'm talking about movies made by indigenous people. Uh, and I'm going to talk about movies that aren't just made here in North America, but all over the world, because the indigenous cinema movement is a global movement. It isn't confined to North America. Uh, and so the image we're seeing here is from a New, a New Zealand film uh, that isn't even out yet. Uh, but you'll see it uh, soon enough. So I'm not really here to talk about the history of representation uh, on screen. We've heard a lot about that recently. Uh, here it is in all of its misguided glory. Uh, actually, the image on the left is from Germany, where they made a whole series of movies. Uh, called Winnetou, uh, all about uh, the people here. Uh, indigenous cinema has about a 40-year history. Um, now, we've heard already about some people that predate uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, we heard yesterday about Lillian St. Cyr, um, that's next to James Young Deer, who's probably the first indigenous uh, filmmaker. He ran the studio for Pathé West Coast. He was a Nanticoke uh, Indian. He made roughly 100 silent westerns for the Pathé brothers uh, in the West, working with uh, Princess Red Wing. But they really made West, you know, westerns, traditional westerns uh, that we that we all know about. The indigenous cinema that I'm going to be talking about traces back to here, so the late 60s, early 70s, when the uh, indigenous people and First Nations all over uh, North America and indeed the world began to assert their own political rights and freedoms more forcefully, sometimes with actual force. And uh, certainly they held uh, similar protests to what was going on in the American Civil Rights Movement at the time. These events shifted the popular discourse uh, around First Nations for the first time in roughly 100 years. Uh, 
and was accompanied by an opening of some cinematic doors to indigenous artists who were very much inspired to take up the camera by what was happening uh, around them. So indigenous cinema as a movement starts as documentaries. And the first key, two key figures in indigenous cinema um, come from literally a world apart from one another. Uh, here we have Alan Isabonsoin, who's an Abenaki filmmaker from Canada, who started out as a singer and storyteller before moving to filmmaking at the National Film Board, which is the large publicly funded um, filmmaking center in Canada uh, in the 1970s. Her, her documentaries, like Incident at Rescue and Kanasatake, 270 Years of Resistance, really chronicle First Nations issues from an indigenous um, perspective. She was very much inspired by what was happening at the time to take her camera and go out and film uh, on site. Uh, Alanis is now 80 years old. In fact, she's now 82. Uh, she still makes movies. She had one just this last, just last month premiere at the Toronto International uh, Film Festival. Um, she's fil finishing a series of films at the Attawapiskat uh, reservation, which um, you probably haven't heard about here in the U.S., but was the subject of much flooding and uh, government intervention in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, she's really a true force of nature and one of my great dear friends. Uh, she's been an inspiration to legions, not only myself and other uh, film curators, but filmmakers all over the world. And she, to indigenous cinema, is our grandmother. Uh, so much begins with her, not just cinema, but a real shift in the dialogue around indigenous issues, largely because of the movies she made. Uh, so she, she started out as, uh, uh, started documentary making in the early 1970s. Maratumita is a uh, Maori filmmaker from New Zealand, and she started <coughs> filmmaking right around the exact same time as Alan East did. Uh, she was also very much inspired by what was happening in New Zealand. Her, uh, she made a film called Bastion Point, Day 507, which was about uh, the government's attempt to reclaim land and the protests that followed. She also made a feature documentary called Patu, which is uh, equally important uh, about the touring of the Springboks. This is, was at the time South Africa was all white rugby team uh, to New Zealand and the protests that the Maori mounted um, against that tour. Interestingly, Bastion Point and Incident Restitution are about the exact same thing. They're about land, about indigenous rights, and about the government intervention militarily to stop those um, things. And like Abomsalin, Mita was very much an activist before she was a filmmaker. And it's important to understand that indigenous <coughs> cinema in the contemporary context started with an activist base. The filmmakers were all very much involved in the community and wanted to make sure our stories were being told in our own voice. And so um, she, they, they started out by taking the camera to the people and to these events. Uh, she, like Alanis, made primarily documentaries, although unlike Alanis, she um, eventually transitioned to feature filmmaking. It's a funny thing. Um, they met in 1983. You know, film festivals play a vital role in the growth of indigenous cinema all over the world. And they met on the film festival circuit, where Bastion Point and Incident and Restigouche, because they were roughly 40 minutes long each, would often be screened together. And they struck a lifelong friendship and were very much colleagues uh, warriors, confidants, and very <coughs> fast friends. Uh, I would also point out one of the other major differences where indigenous cinema diverts from the larger cinema history narrative, which is indigenous cinema started largely with women. In fact, the two primary figures here are women. That is unlike uh, the history of actual cinema, which does come from actuality. So if we think of the early Edisons or the um, uh, Lumiere brothers, they would shoot yeah documentary style footage, um, uh, but they would reenact, of course, you know, the great Lumiere picture about the um, people leaving the factory, the whistleblowing and leaving the factory, they've, of course, shot that twice. So uh, it's also, of course, key to remember that even documentaries can be fictionalized. Um, so it's, I think it's key to understand that these two women, activists and filmmakers and documentary <coughs> filmmakers, are really where the indigenous cinema they're going to be talking about comes from. Now, document, documentaries remain the primary focus of indigenous filmmakers um, for much of the 1980s as well. Uh, although it was during this time that we first started to see a move towards narrative uh, cinema. Uh, and this started not in North America, but actually in New Zealand. 
where a Maori filmmaker named Barry Barclay made the first uh, feature film ever directed by an indigenous person called Nati. Not unsurprisingly, this film is an identity film. So it's about a young doctor who returns to his community. He doesn't really know his entire uh, family history. When he returns there, he finds the community very much in crisis, again, over land. Uh, and, it, and it being taken away and their connection to it. And as the story goes on, he begins to learn more and more about his identity and its connection to the Maori people. Uh, this, so I would say a couple of things um, about Nati. It screened at the Cannes Critic Week in 1987. <coughs> and its existence, of course, is significant if for no other reason than it's the very first indigenous feature uh, ever made. Um, but I would also say it's important because it's set in the 1940s. And so as you can see, You've got indigenous people in non-traditional uh, clothing. You've got them in a contemporary uh, context. And this is really important to understanding where indigenous cinema came from and why the filmmakers started that. So they, if you think of the documentaries, that was all about presenting our current issues. It wasn't about presenting what was in the past. It was about presenting what was happening now. It was about presenting the repercussions of colonialism and not actually discussing the origins of colonialism in here. And of course, the modern Hollywood history of indigenous representation on screens is entirely historical. Uh, they never placed this in a modern context, but it was indigenous filmmakers who urgently did that. And um, because it was the pressing need, it was driven by the need to get these stories out there to affect change, actual change in the community. So Barry Barclay, who was very much involved in the film industry in New Zealand, made this, uh, this film that screened in, in Cannes and went on to be um, quite influential. And then at the time, many asked him, you know, why this particular movie, why he didn't make a historical effort, a, a epic, and whether he expressly wanted to confront the politics of New Zealand at the time. And it's funny, Sterling sort of touched on this a bit yesterday, um, because Barry Barclay said this, my film is about being Maori, and that is political. And Barry Barclay was exactly correct. So the mere fact of placing indigenous people in a contemporary context is a political act. And in fact, I would even argue that existing as an indigenous person in this world is a political function. Our very survival is, is politicized. We, as people, by still being here, are political beings. So Barry Barclay made this movie, uh, Nati. It was the, the first one, um, first movie. <coughs> Uh, that they, uh, this idea is very familiar to indigenous people. Sterling mentioned it yesterday. It's something I think we all uh, live with. Um, but it also brings up something else, which is so much of the origins of indigenous cinema start as a push, as a rebellion against the portrayals in Hollywood. Now, I'm not suggesting Barry Barclay or Alan East or Merata or any of the people we're gonna, I'm going to touch on in, the, in a moment actually thought hey, I've seen Stagecoach, I need to make a movie that refutes what Stagecoach is about. That was not at all their motivation. But what movies ultimately do is push back against that history. They, by acknowledging our existence here and now, they fight against the portrayals ultimately of the past, particularly the idea that we are a vanished people. And that is pretty important because the, you know, a lot of the talking about around the, the portrayals in Hollywood circles around the central issue, which is the movies were an act of, of colonialism. You know, they robbed us of national identity, they robbed us of our history, they grouped us all together, and they then uh, uh, supposed or presupposed that we were not here anymore. And it's within that space, then, that all sorts of other things come forward. It's, it's within that space that you can have a football team named Redskins, and people still talk about it. It's within that space, because of that denial, that um, in Canada, anyway, there's 1,200 missing and murdered Indigenous women in the last 30 years, and the government will refuse to investigate and refuse to do anything about it. And it's why these things continue, because the popular culture is ingrained in so many people growing up that we are gone, that we aren't here anymore, and that we don't matter in this popular discourse. That's why Redskins fans will get so upset and confronted it, because they never actually thought an Indian person was going to come and talk to them about it. <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's very disturbing that that happens. Because, because you know, when the Redskins name was formed, that was very much uh, a reality, or at least that was the goal of both governments, both here in the US and 
in the States and also in Australia. Now, while a movie like Dances with Wolves, uh, even uh, with all of its effort, efforts around authenticity and sympathetic viewpoints, uh, it still ultimately tells a colonial narrative. What's interesting about Dances with Wolves is that it, it, when it came out in 1991, you know, untold number of uh, Oscars, and by the way, it's a terrible movie, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, just it. And I, I mean, I'm very good friends with, with Grant Green, uh, and he would say the same thing. Um, yeah, when I had Grant, Grant Green come to my uh, to cinema recently, I asked him which movie he wanted to show, and he said, just please don't show that fucking thing. <laughs> He got, nominated, he got nominated for an Oscar for it, uh, so there's that. But um, anyway, what was interesting about Dancing with Wolves, though, is that it came out at a time when, when Hollywood had largely ceased making westerns. You know, that western had fallen out of uh, favor for a whole number of, of different reasons, largely due to the rise of science fiction in the 1970s, and that really taking over the sort of epic blockbuster-sized movies that they were interested uh, in making. But Dances with Molson suddenly made it okay again to be native. And in fact, it was around this time that, you know, if you watch Real Engine and you saw me in that movie, that, uh, you know, going to a party as a, as a guy with traditional hair was suddenly really cool. A lot of the girls suddenly wanted to talk to you and touch your hair. <laughs> and, and it made, created, it created a lot of space. <laughs> it's a bad movie, but it had some good benefits. <laughs> Uh, but I think it also opened up the ideas for the filmmaking community to actually tell these stories and in a weird way opened up the doors for indigenous filmmakers to get, I won't even say a foot, I would say a baby toe in the door of uh, modern theatrical uh, production. And so that's ultimately a, a good thing even though the movie's so bad. So it was within the 90s, sort of closely following uh, Dance with Wolves, that you started to see really narrative cinema and First Nations um, voices rise. So we have Lee Tamahori's Landmark, Once Were Warriors, Rachel Perkins, Radiance, Chris Ayer's Smoke Signals, all movies that tell the stories of contemporary indigenous life, the contemporary results of colonialism and about our existence here. And again, that's all pushing back against the history. It's not why these movies were made. It's not why Chris made Smoke Signals, but that was one of the effects that that, that film ultimately had. They also established the foundation for indigenous narrative cinema, already well established on the documentary side. So by the time we get here, indigenous people have been making documentaries for 20 some odd years. But this is really the foundation for the narrative cinema, and what I will argue the foundation for is ultimately what I call the indigenous new wave, which we are existing in right now. There's certainly really key titles and movies that immediately um, preceded the start of the indigenous uh, new wave, and it's these movies that sort of gave rise to the wave, because you know, in cinema history, we often talk about waves, and the most famous one is the French New Wave, which occurred in the 60s. The French New Wave doesn't exist in isolation. None, none of these cinematic waves do. You have to think of movies as the ocean and the waves lapping at the shore, and they regenerate, and they, they come back. So the French New Wave was really the result of the influence of a couple of different movements. Italian neorealism, which occurred right after the post-war in Italy, where they made movies all about their experience of war, very real, very difficult films uh, to watch. If you see Bicycle Thieves, that would be a, a good example of one. As well as the film noir movies that were made in the US in the 1940s, all are ultimately what were adapted and sort of influenced the filmmakers of the French New Wave. So it's important that we understand what started influencing the indigenous New Wave, and these were really um, the movies that did it. Now one of the key figures that really began transitioning us out of what were fairly traditional narratives in a cinematic sense, other than the fact that they were about indigenous people, was a filmmaker from Australia named Tracy Moffat. Now Moffat was primarily a photographer, but she started making film and video work in the 80s and 90s. Um, her fe work features reworked stories, often reflecting other art or film, and places the drama on clearly constructed theatrical backdrops. So in a film she made called Night Cries, she made an imagined sequel to an Australian classic, and I put that in air quotes, called uh, Jetta from 1955, which was all about an, an adopted indigenous uh, girl 
was very much the exact same sort of movie that would have been made in the US in 1955 about indigenous people, very much a sort of Hollywood Western type story. Um, but she sort of remade it from the uh, idea of this little girl having now grown up and having to care for the woman who adopted her and the fractious relationship uh, that they would have. Moffat's first feature film in the 90s is a landmark uh, movie, and the movie that points to where the new wave is ultimately going to go. It's a film called The Devil, and it features three Aboriginal ghost stories. And it's among the first films to dispense with traditional cinematic narrative structure in favor of more indigenous storytelling structure. So one of the, the key things you have to understand is that cinema is not an indigenous tradition in terms of storytelling. It, it's an entirely Western tradition. And it, and it acts in a three-act structure, which is the Western narrative structure, which is not how in, in, um, most First Nations tell stories. We tend to tell stories in circles, and they come back to, to one another. So it's, it's been a challenge to actually fit that style of storytelling into cinematic language, because cinematic language is not meant to actually transmit those. The devil does. One of the key things it does um, is it obscures the line between dream and reality. So you're, ne you're never quite sure if the ghosts are meant to be seen or if they're just part of, of um, the story, which is key for a lot of indigenous people because sometimes we don't separate the difference between the spirit world and the, the tangible world that we, we physically uh, exist in. And so the film's very much a precursor to the, the new wave. And we, we see a lot of the sort of elements um, begin to merge uh, here. And it's key because we're beginning to see indigenous mythology told by indigenous people in a cinematic form. And you know, ultimately what's really important, and, and Cindy got it right, I do love movies. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I do is because they travel the world in a way that no other art does. They, they're seen by people and they can communicate ideas to people regardless of culture all over the planet. And they, and they are, were, and remain the most pervasive art form of the last hundred years. There was no more art form consumed than movies in the 20th century. That's why the damaging movies of Hollywood were so damaging, because they were viewed by so many. And why indigenous cinema is so important, because it allows us to get our stories out in a, a very large uh, way. So it's all of these sort of things condense and, and begin in a film called The Devil, which, you've, which is criminally underseen uh, in North America. It did not gain a theatrical release in North America at the time. You can probably see it, uh, a crappy version of it on YouTube. Um, but if you can find it, you may have to import it from um, Australia. I highly recommend uh, the movie. It's, it's uh, truly fantastic. And in terms of leading us to a new way, it, it's a direct precursor to a film like Adonar Joa, which I'll get to in a minute, and is probably the first film that I would identify as being in the indigenous new way. Now, Adonar is, uh, is a film made in Canada's north, in the Inuit, in the Kalut, um, in Inuktitut. It's the first feature-length film ever filmed entirely in Inuktitut. And I would argue it's the first film in what we would now be existing in is, is the indigenous new wave. It's based on a very old Inuit uh, legend. It's a myth, uh, but like so many things in indigenous culture, it has a basis in reality. So a lot of the people in the film would identify as ancestors of the characters they're playing. So they, to them, this is a very, very truthful uh, story. It was produced by Suma, a company formed by an artist, Zach Canuck, and Norm Cohen, a filmmaker who was born in New York, but who was working in Montreal at the time and moved to the North in the early 80s. Uh, Zach was a very accomplished visual artist by the time he ever picked up a camera. He was uh, already um, well established as a carver. And he picked up his first video camera in the early 1980s and started making videos in the North uh, in around 1985. And like the very foundation of indigenous cinema that I've already talked about, the documentaries, they started by making sort of documentaries, but they weren't quite in that they were entire, um, entirely reenactments of stories. So the, the people would come and tell Zach um, or Norm these stories, and they would sort of reenact them. But they're true events. It's just actors portraying uh, the true events. They produced uh, countless uh, videos up there, all of them can be watched right now on their channel. If you go and watch Asuna.tv, uh, they have all the videos uh, up there. And so, a film like Adonarjoa is directly tied to the origins of indigenous cinema, to that documentary tradition, that activist tradition of telling the current stories and getting those up on screen, but it also follows out of a film like The Devil, and the, the um, beginning to have 
in, you know, indigenous stories adapted for the screen, or as I like to put it, having film language adapted to fit indigenous uh, stories. It was a huge success. It won a prize at the Cannes uh, Film Festival, which is largely regarded as the most important film festival uh, in the world. Uh, it won the, uh, the Tar Ungaluk, who's the uh, star there, you can see a great guy, an amazing actor, uh, won countless acting awards for it, made more than $2 million at the domestic box office, that's just in Canada. That doesn't count uh, North America or the rest of, uh, rest of the world. And uh, really sort of paved the way, you would think, for a lot of the indigenous uh, cinema that would follow. In the, the film's most iconic scene, uh, the tar is forced to run barefoot and naked across the ice. Now, as part of the commitment of the storytellers to the way they, they did this, he had thick feet uh, that they made for him that he would wear, that sort of strapped over his real feet so that he could walk, and they immediately were destroyed by cutting on the ice. They, the ice just sliced right through the, the latex uh, uh, bodies. So he ended up having to shoot the scene in barefoot, and his feet became a total mess, but it was part of the commitment to telling the story because this is a very important legend to the community. So when Natar took the part, he knew that that scene was in the story. It's the most iconic scene. It's why the movie's called The Fast Runner. And he knew he would have to run across the ice, and he did it because that's the commitment to telling the story correctly. There was no other way, ultimately, uh, to do it. And in so many ways, that's the essence of the indigenous uh, new wave. Because one of the other things, besides actually physically having to put himself through the exact experiences uh, that his character did, they recreated all the costuming, everything, in the traditional way. So every element of the movie is done in the way it would have been done at the setting of the, the film. So not only is that an argument, a film about a mythic tale, about a very traditional story, it's actually cultural re-engagement and re -enlivening. So it actually allowed people in the North to relearn some of the skills that they may have forgotten in terms of making the clothing, making the uh, oil, the seal oil lamps, all of that um, sort of elements of the production of the film actually re-engaged the community actively. So even the sunglasses, the bone slit sunglasses, they actually had to craft um, like they would have been for. Again, because you're looking for an authentic portrayal and because that's how you have to do it if you're going to tell this story. There he is, running across the ice. Now, because of the way Adam Arjoa uh, was produced, it adapts not only the sort of documentary aesthetic of foundational indigenous cinema, but it adds the elements of dreamscape found in, in Tracy Moffat's work, and communicates this through narrative, um, narrative cinema, and uses classic epic uh, elements. So, Adam Arjoa, as a movie, is roughly three hours long. It is very, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to, to find it. It is grandiose in its scale. It is a true widescreen, old school, almost DeMille like um, production. And, and its success really um, did lead both Asuma um, initially to make a couple of other movies. They made um, the even better and angrier Journals of Canoe Grass Music, which is actually their contact story. It's the Inuit story of their first encounter um, with settlers. Um, it's a doomsday story, of course. And I think this is actually a better film than Adam Arjwa. This film opened the Toronto International Film Festival in uh, 2006, which um, somewhat coincidentally is the year I started working for them. Uh, and, it was... <laughs> um, and then they got to make another film with a collective of women filmmakers called the Arnate Collective, also in Iqaluit. Uh, and they made a movie called Before Tomorrow, which is a indigenous apocalypse. Uh, story, thus completing what is now known as the Fast Runner um, trilogy. All the movies were made in the exact same way, so all the clothing is made in the traditional way, all the, the filming is actually done by natural light, so they didn't use brought in lights, they used the candlelight, they had to use a, uh, a what at the time was a very sophisticated video camera, so it's not actually shot on celluloid, it's shot in video, they would, they would say they're video artists, and that's because they needed that um, to be able to absorb enough light. Uh, film stock just wasn't going to be able to do it, particularly inside the igloos, where they were only using the oil light lamps for light. What's interesting about all of these movies is that you begin to see reflections of them in the films that came after them. So, um, there's Before Tomorrow. That's a great movie. 
Um, it won, that Before Tomorrow, by the way, won the best uh, Canadian feature at the Toronto Film Festival when it played uh, there. Uh, so Adam Arjola's influence can be found in the sort of naturalistic films uh, like Samson and Delilah, which is an Australian movie, uh, as well as Tumala, a film that was shot in, uh, again in Australia, all with non-professional actors, all within the community the movies are set in, and all tell the stories derived from the everyday existence of indigenous people uh, there. This influence stretches as far as Samoa, which in 2012 produced its first feature film in that country's history, called The Order. It's a film about, uh, oh, we're gonna get to that in a second. It's a film uh, all about tradition, and like Adam Orger, it draws on Samoan history and mythology while using non-professional actors and authentic sets and costumes. Um, but as a, you know, and can also be seen in Four Sheets in the Wind, which uh, realism, again, telling a contemporary indigenous story uh, is very much an echo of films like Adam Arjua and these films that is made by Sterling right there. So, one of the other things, though, that's key to the new wave that Adam Arjua did, and it was unclear to me at the time how important this would actually be, was that as much as it, it, it presented indigenous ideas and indigenous storytelling on the screen, it was an epic film. And Zach and Norm knew exactly what they were doing. They always knew that there, this was a trilogy, that they were going to make three movies, that, or at least that was the goal, that they would make three movies. But they very consciously picked this one as the first film. And that's because it speaks so directly to traditional cinema language. So even though it is a very much an Inuit story and using Inuit storytelling techniques, because of shots like this, you begin to place it in a much grander and larger historical context of cinema history. And using that style, using genres that we would have seen in something like Ben-Hur, that sort of grand scale, um, or perhaps more importantly, in a film like The Searchers, where again you have an individual against a, set against a large, wide open landscape, this time seen through the, uh, the door. Um, because it does that, it actually allowed, I think, a lot of uh, indigenous filmmakers to begin to think of how they could use what has been traditional cinematic or genre cinema language and use that to tell their, their stories and embed their stories into films that can speak in a different way. Um, so, for example, I would call Adam Arjua a northern as opposed to a western. Um, just as I would call some, Aus some Australian films more easterns than they are uh, westerns. And, and because of this combination of, of myth with um, large-scale uh, epic storytelling, that really is now we're seeing the influence of this in the movies that are, that are coming out. So again, you know, if we remember back to the French New Wave, you need other films to inspire the new films. You know, in, in cinema language, so much has already been done. So it's all about taking elements that pre-exist and changing them into something uh, new. And so you begin to see in the indigenous New Wave elements of other storytelling techniques or other cinematic storytelling techniques. So for example, in a film like On the Ice, which is made in Alaska, in a second in Alaska, First Nations community in Alaska, by a very nice guy named uh, Andrew Obiak McLean, um, this is a film noir set. It's a murder mystery set mm -hmm. in the far north. It operates very much like a traditional film noir, except it's not set in an urban setting, and it's not dark. It's bright sunlight because it's Alaska. Or in a film like Jeff Barnaby's Rhymes for Young Ghouls, this is a more recent um, movie, crime drama set on a set in the 70s, a rather gritty, unflinching look at life uh, on what was ultimately Jeff's res in the 1970s. It's all about drug culture, drug dealing, murder, and ultimately residential schools is, is really what the film is uh, is about. But it's interesting because at the same time it draws on the same documentary tradition that Indigenous cinema started. So Jeff is very, was, in fact, if I had Jeff here, he would say the film that inspired him most was Alan Eason's film, The Incident at Restigouche, all those years. That's the film that politicized him and made him think that film, cinema could tell some of these stories and could actually make uh, change. Um, but perhaps the best example uh, of this is a film that had its premiere. I'm really running through this. I'm going to end early, folks. Um, 
just screened actually. Um, and well, before I do this, I mean, I think if you want, it, and I encourage you to see this, this did get picked up for distribution in the US by Monterey Media, uh, which is a very small distribution company in California. It was released in, in Canada to a somewhat mild uh, reception, although it, it, I mean, it just played the Warsaw Film Festival uh, in Poland. Can you give us the name again? Sorry. Rhymes for Young Ghouls. Uh, I don't think there's R H Y M E S rhymes, uh, and I think uh, it, it, it's as much a film influenced by Scorsese and Carpenter as it is by Alanis uh, Abomsalin. Uh, and again, these are films that are, are less about. A and what's interesting about the new wave is that the films increasingly become less about the resistance against Hollywood uh, and cinema history, as they are about as asserting indigenous stories within their own tradition. So. What you start to have with the indigenous new wave is you have a body of work for which these filmmakers can rely on. So when Alan East started making movies, there were no other indigenous filmmakers for her to look to and say, that's what I should be doing. So she just went out and did it. What you have now, though, is you have a whole tradition that can be built upon. So you have other films that current filmmakers can look to and begin to adapt those into their own storytelling. And perhaps this is best uh, example is a film that just premiered last month at the Toronto International Film Festival called The Deadlands. And this is a film by New Zealand, directed by Toa Fraser, who himself is uh, from Fiji. The film was made with extensive engagement with the Maori community, as all films in New Zealand about uh, Maori people have to be made. Um, this was both to make sure the veracity of the period details, like the costuming that you see here, and as well as the legend the story is based on. It's a film set 600 years before Contact. I think that's also key, because Adam Arjua is also a film set entirely before there was settlers here. And so you start to have indigenous people telling, truly telling our own stories, and not refracting or reflecting those through the experience of colonialization. So, you, so these are movies that are devoid of any of that history. And in that way, they're actually the most activist cinema. They're the, the films that, in fact, resist and, I would say, destroy the ultimately Hollywood image of the Indian. Because they are so not concerned at all with that, that point of view. They, they completely rise above it. The other interesting thing about The Deadlands is, like Adam Arjua, it was a, um, very much about cultural recreation. So the Maori, the weapons you see, are traditional Maori weapons. They're used in the um, traditional Maori martial art, which is called Maorahu, uh, which means to bear a weapon. Uh, but most Maori people have only ever used these in ceremony. They've never actually used them to fight anyone, because they're, they're so far removed from that, that history. So in, in terms of actually producing the film, all the actors had to go through extensive training to not only learn Maoruku, the, the martial art, but also how you use these weapons in something other than a ceremonial practice, and to use them as fighting weapons. So again, it's not only is the film presenting us to the outside world, but within the community, it's actually rebuilding connections to the past. It's, it's rebuilding a cultural sense that wasn't there before. There's Lawrence, who's the star and uh, the monster of the film. So this is very much building on the, the tradition Adam Arjwad started at the very beginning of, of the new wave. So not only does it tell a traditional story using a blend of indigenous storytelling techniques, because this is a film, again, where the dreamscape and, and what we would call tangible reality interact rather seamlessly. Uh, but it also uses classic cinematic tropes. This is a kung fu movie. If you've ever seen a martial arts movie, anything mm -hmm. by Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. this is it, the exact same idea. Mm -hmm but telling a purely indigenous story, a story that doesn't connect with, with any sort of colonial uh, history. And so not only is the production one of indigenous storytelling, but it's also one of cultural preservation. There's the cast at the Toronto Film Festival performing the traditional haka uh, war dance. I love it because they're all in their Armani suits. <laughs> And it was, uh, it was quite the screening. Um, uh, you know, there was, I want to say there was three indigenous films at the film festival this past year. Um, this one uh, came looking to be sold internationally, to have its rights sold internationally. It did sell everywhere currently but North America. I think they're just waiting for the best offer. Um, 
It would not surprise me at all. In fact, I would predict here that The Deadlands will be the most watched indigenous film in history, and that's because it is a kung fu movie. And I think that's really important to understand, that is that the filmmakers are becoming ever more savvy in how they go about getting these stories out. Because one of the real problems with indigenous cinema, indigenous new wave aside, has been the actual business side of movies, which is distribution and exhibition of these, of these films. So while we have some successes, like out in Arjua, a lot of films don't get as widely distributed or as widely seen as they ultimately should. Uh, or, and, and a lot of that is because distributors don't see business. And you know, the move, movie business, like any other um, you know, capitalist economy, is driven entirely by money. And that's really all they care about. They're not interested that Adonarjwa or the Deadlands is actually cultural preservation enacted in a cinematic form. They don't care. What they care is that someone will pay 12 bucks to go see it in a theater. And unfortunately, for most indigenous cinema, they don't see a market for it. Beyond the indigenous audience, um, which is small in comparison to the, the wide-scale audience, and uh, they don't see it. And you know, you have to think in, in Hollywood terms, these days they make films that they say are four-quadrant movies, so that, that appeal to the four-quadrant demographics of the world, which I would say basically means they make movies for the square states, if I was talking in the US. They make movies for the very middle, the country. They don't make movies for New York or they don't make movies for California. Those movies get made, but that's not what the studios and the distributors are actually all that interested in. They're interested in movies that will play right down the middle, that can play in 3,000 screens, and that can turn a huge profit. And that is, up until recently, has not necessarily been indigenous cinema. And I think what we're seeing in the indigenous new wave now is filmmakers coming to grips with that idea and knowing that they still want to tell indigenous stories. They still want to get these stories out there, but in order to do that, they'll adapt classic cinema genres, take all of those tropes, turn them upside down. So while, while the distributor's gonna go watch The Deadlands and see, wow, this is a kung fu movie with lots of blood and violence, and boy, I'm gonna pack cinemas with this thing, I see something totally different. I see an indigenous story that's gonna be watched by non-indigenous people all over the world, and within that is gonna communicate something really fundamental which is that we were here many, many, many generations ago, and we're still here, and because we can tell, because we're making movies about ourselves. The other key thing is that Deadlands and Under Marjola are true historical movies. And if you remember, indigenous cinema started about what's happening right now. It was, it was the filmmakers going out and filming what was in their communities. They weren't actually concerned with the historical past. They were concerned with the repercussions of that historical past. Now, in the indigenous new wave, we actually begin to see period pieces. Pieces that speak to a history, but it isn't the colonial history. So they're not making movies about first contact, they're making movies about pre-contact. When, 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 when it isn't written down, or, or let me put it another way, isn't written down by non-indigenous people. And this is a real key moment in indigenous cinema, and I think it's thrilling that we're actually living it right now. And certainly my hopes is that filmmakers like Sterling will have a, find a much larger space for their movies as they go forward. Because not only have, have we got films that are now addressing the commercial concerns of the movie industry, but are also, in that context, addressing the concerns of indigenous people. And I think that's really key. Um, because I think for so many years, the artists were making these movies, and they would end up on the, in the, the discount bin. Or worse, nowhere at all. And I, I think we're increasingly getting to a point where that will be uh, harder. It's still going to be a challenge to get these movies into commercial movie theaters. As someone who runs a movie theater myself, uh, you, you really do make a lot of decisions based on what's going to get a good opening weekend and all of that sort of business. Um, but these movies can actually generate that. And so I think there's a life for indigenous cinema um, that is, what is now here that wasn't here literally just 10 years ago. So it's rapidly um, improving. Now I want to uh, end, uh, that's sort of the, the whole of my discussion went rather quickly. But uh, I do want to end because showing a movie, because I love showing movies. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to watch a film by a dear friend of mine named Danis Goulet. Uh, she's a, a Cree filmmaker from Canada. And she made, where is this? 
She made this movie. Um, this movie is called Awakening. It's a short film, it's just about nine minutes uh, long. You'll see why I chose it. And it speaks very much to, to what I'm talking about in terms of the elements of the indigenous new wave that were existing right now. It was commissioned by the Elgin Theatre in Toronto, Canada, which is, uh, was celebrating its 100th year of being a show, a theatre. This short screen was the first film screen at the 2013 Toronto International Film Festival before the opening night film, which was um, the, uh, what was that? Uh, the Fifth Estate, a rather horrible movie. Uh, but luckily they saw a really good one uh, right before. And you'll see that it blends classic cinema genres that we're all familiar with, in this case, I say fantasy and science fiction, with a truly indigenous story. And that blend is what really is gonna move indigenous cinema uh, forward as we begin to take control of those tropes and use them for our own purposes. So please enjoy Awakening. So uh, I would say a couple of things. Um, so the the Wittigo, uh, which is the, what it's called in Cree, Wittigo in um, Ojibwe, is a very ancient story. Uh, and I, it was funny, before Dennis made this movie, I used to complain to her, no one has ever made a good Wittigo movie. I mean, there's a million of them. They're all uh, But finally, someone, I guess she took it upon herself uh, to do it. Sajachak, of course, is also a very um, historic character, the trickster, the coyote trickster. Um, the other thing I would say is I'm often asked, uh, you know, what the future of indigenous cinema is. That's it. Uh, and I think that is, it, what you saw there is a blend of horror movies, science fiction, fantasy, and an ancient indigenous story. We're talking ancient, before time. And here it is um, produced. Dennis is currently looking to make a feature film, a science fiction feature film. We're just going to find her a couple million bucks uh, to do that. Uh, and Jeff Barnaby, who I mentioned earlier, rhymes for Young Ghouls. Um, he's working with the folks who make the series Walking Dead. And he's going to make a movie called Blood Quantum, which will be an indigenous zombie movie, and will likely replace Deadlands as the most watched indigenous movie in history when it comes out. So, uh, I think I'd like to end there by saying, if you, if you wanted to know what the future of indigenous movies looks like, you just saw it.